Hey, thank you very much for that. David, good to see you, sir. Hello. Awesome. So uh, Dave Ferguson, uh, David Singer, by the way, is um, one of our first apprentices coming out of Digital Church Network. And so excited to see that, definitely. Uh, We still got to figure out what that means. We're still putting some pieces together, but definitely excited uh, about what's what's going on. David's working with um, uh, Dan Tebow uh, with uh, a digital church that's aimed at um, uh, law enforcement. Some really uh, interesting things coming out of that. Mark Lutz coming in. Uh, hey, Mark. What's up, y'all? Mark's with uh, Mark's got the best setup of, of the room today. I can already tell. He's with uh, Lux Digital Church. I'm currently at an Airbnb in Kansas City, and so it's 45 degrees outside right now here in Kansas City. Really? Right. Yes, 45 degrees, and I'm, I'm like outside in, t- in, in short sleeves that I'm freezing. Yeah, but you're you're like a Florida boy, so that's the problem. Yeah, that, that's, he's that's a big true. baby. I'm, I'm, <laughs> so it's weakness. Fifty-six in Chicago. It's fifty-six in Chicago. Six in Chicago. A balmy fifty-six. Okay. All right. I, allegedly, I have really good Kansas City barbecue coming to me. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. They're, I'm allegedly getting it delivered. You know where you're going? Uh, Joe's? Hold on. Let me, let me pull the actual Joe's Casey Original Gas Station Restaurant. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, that's a good one. Is that a good one? Okay. Yeah. I, I ordered, I believe it's called the Hog Maniac. Uh, it's ribs, it's, it's pulled pork, and it's sausage. Um, and oh, I plan on eating it. At, yeah, and that, that's going in the belly at about 10 p.m. Eastern. So it's, it's going to be a, an enjoyable night uh, for me, as I'm sure that's going to be coming up quite a bit. Awesome. Yeah. Jeff, you want to hear the coolest thing that's happened at Lux that happened today? Sure. So we had the first baby born in our church uh, yet. So we had not had anybody have a kid, but uh, my buddy Gino and Rachel, who um, go to our church, had their child. And they they named their, their the second name of their child is Lux, named after our church because of the experience of spiritual revival they've had at at Lux. So uh just super cool it was it was a it was a it was totally unexpected we knew they were having the baby we've been praying for them uh we've been praying for rachel and keeping up to date with them um but uh but it was really cool whenever we got the text i asked him kind of like why and he said we appreciate everything that y'all have done for our family um uh y'all have made uh reconnecting with god fun easy and possible we couldn't have found a better place to call our spiritual home and it's because of everyone in this server so thank you all and thank god and so that was just a really cool, that was a cool win today. You don't get them all the time, but that was a cool one. That is awesome. Well, digital churches aren't real. Everybody knows that. What, what, what's, I don't want to see what the big, I don't understand. That is so awesome. So are you, are you, does that make you like the godfather? Are you going to like, do, do you, are you christening digitally? Like, is, 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 that, is that allowed? Do, what, what? Uh, she'll dunking? be our first like, child what? dedication. She'll be our first child okay, dedication. Child dedication. So we'll, We'll probably bring uh, Rachel and Bougie live on video with their daughter and do uh, a live child dedication. We've never done one before, but we'll we'll probably experience that for the first time. So, so I didn't mean to hijack things. I just get excited. Hey, Mark, that's that's we, awesome. Mark, we had somebody at our church. I, they, they became a Christ follower there. We talked about finding their way back to God there. And so they they took the church logo and, tat, and got a tattoo made of it, which is pretty <laughs> cool. Except we went through a rebranding, and so they had the old logo on the oh. body. Mm. <laughs> you got to schedule that cover-up tattoo. Like, hey, could you tweak this? Because they have a new logo, right? Sure. Yes. <laughs> or on, maybe Zoom call. Cool as a baby. Not as cool as a baby. But well, I maybe you wear like a badge of pride, right? You're like an OG because you're like, no, bro, I got the, I got saved in the old logo. You can see by the permanent tat on my lower back, there like. You go. I, Maybe that's what it is, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, tattoos of churches and, and naming babies. Like, this is awesome. This is all about what digital churches are about. 
Um, hopefully we're about more than that, but it's at least it's it's a good start for this. Guys, hey, I am super excited. Go ahead, yeah, Dave. Can I give a shout out here? I think we got Cadis joining us from uh, Belarus. Yeah, I was about to say, he may be the furthest person at this point coming in. Uh, I don't know what time it is at, at Belarus, but definitely excited to have Cadis uh, join us. It's probably late enough that he doesn't have um, the uh, the camera on, which would make sense in his context. So, cool. Hey, um, let's, uh, uh, Dave, let's go and get started. By the way, let me introduce, in case you don't know, Dave Ferguson uh, into the conversation. Uh, Dave is, oh, so many different things. Dave, how many hats are you actually wearing right now? Just one, and that is Jeff Reed Groupie. Just the one hat. <laughs> But let's yeah okay. i'm gonna turn that into my ringtone and it's gonna be awesome <laughs> that, that's gonna be great thank you for that hey listen dave is um lead pastor community christian church uh ceo of exponential very involved obviously with leadership network with that new thing network visionary leadership so much um going on by the way in 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 serious tones to me he's probably one of the um most well-known church leaders that is comfortable with digital expressions of church and metaverse expressions of church. And so uh, that makes him, um, well, let's just be honest, one of very few people, but it's awesome to see the what support you're that not, he's not given. Really that hard. <laughs> yeah. It's been awesome to see the support that, that he's given uh, to digital churches. And what's funny is Nathan Schindler just walked in to the zoom call and he's like, literally like right over there. Don't, don't unmute because it'll get noisy, uh, but definitely excited about this call and, and talking about digital missionaries. And, and so we, we did a call, we did a, a podcast maybe two weeks ago with John Ferguson, really starting to unpack the idea of the blessed practices and how that feeds into uh, potentially what a digital missionary could look like in our churches. And, and so I want to take advantage of, of some of that time tonight where we can start to unpack more of the, the culture of that, what it looks like and how uh, maybe this can really be the framework as we start to look at what a digital missionary could be and what it means to really get our people that are in our digital and metaverse churches on mission uh, physically in digital space. So, hey, uh, there's a, a lot of fun people in this room and we're going to record it and uh, post it for, for on demand as well. But I want to right up at the front here, you know, hand it off to uh, to Dave. Dave, I think this is the best I could do to set you up. Are you good? You ready to move forward? Uh, I I am good. Yeah. So we'll I'll uh, I'll talk for just a little bit, and then we're gonna chat it up or something, do some Q and A or things like that. Yeah. So uh, one thing about Dave is Dave is so much, but to say that Dave's an expert on digital church, I don't know that anybody's an expert on digital church. So. Dave's really going to focus in on uh, blessed practices, maybe some of the things that, that he's doing and some of the things that he's seeing. Here's what I'd like to do is I really want to focus on Q&A and conversations on the backside of this. I want your help. I would love insight from you all on how do we take these blessed practices? How do we turn it in, into a framework? Is it going to work? What are the challenges? I want to use this almost like the focus group to really start to wrestle with the idea, can this work? How would this work? What do we need to do to make this work? What are the opportunities? So we're gonna get very conversational on, the, on the, the back third, the back half of this conversation. But we'd love for Dave just even to set it up a little bit here up at the front, okay? All right. Um, I'm gonna start kind of with my story. I mean, when I, when I first became a Christ follower, I mean, I was like 19, 20 years of age and genuinely just so pumped, so excited about the love of God. I think I got grace like for the very first time. If you remember what that was like when you really understood grace for the very, very first time. And I, I mean, I want to share that with everybody. And I think maybe wired the way I am, I tried. But I, I, I have to say, I did it in the most obnoxious way possible. <laughs> um, I remember like I would, I would be, I would do street evangelism. Um, I would walk straight up to people, basically verbally assault them. I don't know if you remember the two diagnostic questions. I would say, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain if you die tonight, you'd go to heaven? 
And if, if they dared to answer that question, then I would, I would assault them with another question. And I'd, I'd say, and if you did that tonight and God asked you, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you say? And basically what I was doing in kind of this approach was I was asking questions that answering questions rather that nobody was asking. And I was asking questions that they didn't want to answer. And basically it was a total disaster. Just didn't, didn't work. It was good motives, but just did not work. A few years later, I become a youth pastor. Then eventually at age 25, I become a, a church planner. And so I said, okay, you know what? Forget that. What I want to do is I want to just kind of live my life for Jesus. Um, the other didn't work. I'm just going to live my life for Jesus. I'm going to try to live like him and not use words. And the end result in my neighborhood was I think my neighbors thought I was a really good guy, um, but nobody came to know Jesus. And I just, for me, there, I felt like there had to be a better way. And I think now, even as a pastor then, I know not only did I want it for, for me, but I also wanted it for the people in my church. And for a very long time, I was you know, familiar with Genesis chapter 12. I, I kind of call it the blessing strategy now where, you know, God speaking to Abraham, he said, listen, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. Um, you're going to be a blessing and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. And God was basically saying, you know, I'm going to bless you. And then you're going to bless the rest of the world. And I think for a long time, I thought of that more as kind of a pithy saying, you know, you're blessed to be a blessing or like a bumper sticker or something you see crocheted on a, on a pillow somewhere um, rather than really how to love your neighbor, how to change the world. But there was something that I ran across that made me kind of rethink that. And um, I don't know if John shared this or not. You can, you can jump in here two weeks ago if you guys heard it. But I ran across this, this, this study called Blessers versus Converters. I don't think you've heard me tell this or maybe John told it or not. It's called Blessers versus Converters. It's actually, it was kind of buried in a doctoral thesis. And the study was based on two teams of missionaries that both went to Thailand. Uh, they went to Thailand with two distinctly different missional strategies. So, and what they had, there was, there was what they, they literally called one group, the converters, and their sole intention was just to convert people, to evangelize people. Um, and they would even say, we're trying to save souls back in the day. And then they had the second group was the, was the blessers. And their sole intention was just to bless people. And they would even say, we're just here to bless, just bless whoever God brings our way. They followed these two different teams of missionaries for two years, and they had two observations they, they discovered. First, they discovered that the blessers, actually their presence in the community created a lot more what you'd call social capital. It was a be made it a better place to live, a better society, a better community life. Nothing. There was no measurable difference in regards to the difference the converters made as far as social capital. That was the first observation. The second observation they made, though, and this was very surprising, was the blessers over two years actually had 50 times as many conversions as did the converters, that the blessers actually saw 100 people, almost 100, not quite, but almost 100 people come to faith, you know, find and follow Jesus, versus the converters over the course of two years had two. And the kind of the bottom line on this, this study was that if you're trying to love your neighbor, if you're going to share the love of God with someone else, the best way in the way they kind of coined it was to be a blesser. Now that, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and throw, I'm going to, I was going to share my screen. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. I got some stuff. On, we'll just do that. Um, then I ran across this Barna uh, research, Barna, the Barna Research Group did a study, and it was kind of an eye-opener that's just kind of followed suit with this, and they asked people um, that would be like our friends and neighbors, they said, what would you value in a person with whom you'd talk about spiritual matters? That was the question they asked them. What would you value in a person with whom you would dare to talk about spiritual matters? And here, here were the top three qualities that came, in, that came up in order. The number one thing, they said this, we would, I would value someone who would listen to me without judgment. Someone who'd listen to me without judgment. And I, I, would, I would follow it up with, I think listening is one of the purest acts of love. 
And, and the sad news in this, in this study was that two thirds of the people that were surveyed said they had nobody in their life that they felt like listened to them without judgment. And I started thinking about some of my early attempts, okay, to share God's love. And my focus was always on what I would say. And so consequently, I did most of the talking. And if I did ask a question, the only reason I asked a question was not to actually listen, but it was so I could kind of maneuver the conversation in a way so I could respond with this clever answer. Um, and I think, I, I genuinely think, maybe today more than ever in my lifetime, people need other people who will just listen to them, listen to their story. And it's something we're all capable of doing. The second thing they said, when they ask our friends, our neighbors, who would you most likely talk to about spiritual things? They said, someone who listens without judgment. And secondly, they said, someone who will allow me to draw my own conclusions. And this is just another one of those great reminders that our neighbors and our friends, whether it's literally next door, like Ray and Nikki, or it's digitally next door, they're, they're not projects, they're people. And, and they're looking for someone who will not force a conclusion on them, but will trust them to have their own spiritual journey. The, the same way that God trusted us to have our own spiritual journey. And again, when I think about my early failed attempts, okay, my heart was in a good place, but my strategy was just brutal because I knew the outcome I wanted. I wanted them to say yes. I wanted to, you know, a chance to baptize them that night. <laughs> so it was good intentions, uh, but poor tactics. The, the third quality they said they were looking for was they wanted someone who has confidence in sharing their own perspective. So after you, number one, listen to your friend, and secondly, after you give them the space to come to their own conclusion, it's then and only then that people around us are saying, okay, now I would like for you to confidently share your own perspective. And um, I, I just kind of call that paying the relational rent. That once you've invested in a relationship by listening to them and loving them, no, no matter what they ultimately decide, then you'll have a permanent place in their life. And hopefully you'll have the opportunity to share your story about the difference that Jesus has made in your life um, with, with them. Now, for me, with that blessers versus converters uh, kind of doctoral thesis, and then some of this research from Barna, I began to look at the life of Jesus. And I, what I discovered in his life and ministry, this, is, this is really was his approach, that he did listen without judgment. In fact, if you go back to the Gospels, and some people have documented this too, I mean, th there's about... 50 questions he asks for every answer that he gives in the Gospels. Um, he also allowed others to draw their own conclusions. Like, think about the rich young ruler. He, he, he told him the truth. Here's what you need to do. And he, he let him. He walked away sad. And he also, he confidently shared the good news. He, he said, I am, I am the way. And, and the, the, the more I studied, I think, Jesus' life and ministry, the more I began to see that what emerged kind of for us were these kind of these five missional practices uh, that he would use over and over again to love people, to bless people. And what we simply did then is we kind of took those and go like, how do we put this in a package, put this in a way that actually is memorable, that sticks with people. And that's when we came up with the, with this, with this bless acronym that um, it, it is, it is, it has made a big, big difference at community Christian church, as far as mobilizing people for mission and, um, it's become the national evangelism strategy for the covenant denomination. Um, there's a whole, there's about 400 churches in, in Austin now that are doing something called Bless Austin, where in the next uh, five years, they want to actually bless by name all 2.7 million people across Austin. Um, and it's kind of, it's gotten some traction. Now, John already shared this, so I'll just hit him real quick. If you have questions about him, we can talk about him. But simply, they're, the, they're this. The B stands for begin with prayer. And again, with Jesus, our example, I mean, when he started his earthly ministry in Luke chapter six, it says he went out on the mountain and he prayed. And I'm, this, is, this is my journal. And um, one of the things I try to do on a regular basis, I just write the word bless on here. And then I write the names of like, you know, uh, five to eight of my friends or neighbors. And you know what? These are people I'm, these are people that I'm praying for. And I'm saying, okay, you know, God, give me a chance to really 
share your love with them. Um, the L stands for listen. And again, I personally think one of the one of the real issues with with more Christians as a whole is that we're much more known for our talking than we are our listening. And I love the example of Jesus, like in, in Luke chapter 18, with the blind man. He, he doesn't assume that the blind man wants to see. The first thing he does, he says, what do you want me to do? He asks him a question. He, he gives him dignity and waits and listens, listens for his response. And then he, then he, then he heals them. Um, the E stands for eat. One of the things I love about the blessed practices, different than maybe some other missional strategy or even outreach or evangelistic kind of strategies, is this is not something that you have to do in addition to your life. This is how you live your life. And so, like even the eating part, you have 21 opportunities. You know, if you eat three times a day, uh, throw in a you know coffee or dessert, you may have 30. You have 30 kind of opportunities to include other people in your life. And I can go on and on about that one. I love it. Uh, the S again, Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And here's the deal. Once you're praying for somebody and you're listening to them and you get to the place where you're sharing meals with them, I tell people, this is like a remedial course in friendship. And that's what Jesus did. He was called a friend of sinners. And, and for any of you that are married, okay. Or you've dated anybody seriously. I mean, you do the same thing. You know, some of you maybe pray, but you listen, you eat, and then you serve. You love them the way they want to be loved. That's how you develop relationships. You serve them. And then lastly is, is story. And the story part is, is I think, just understanding that, yes, proclamation is important, but it doesn't necessarily have to be first. And then, in fact, after you've paid the relational rent, when you tell your story then, um, then it's much more. If the collateral of the story is, has a lot more gravity to it because now they they trust you, they know you, and maybe they they even they even kind of love you. Um, so this has been a big big help to me personally. It's been a big help to the people in our church and um, and um, a number of people really around the world is who we've got a chance to, to share this with. So. Um, I'll just put that out there. That's kind of a little bit of my story, how we kind of got there, and then the, um, kind of the implementation of it. Yeah, beautiful. So you've got the bless. Uh, so begin with prayer. Uh, oh, before doing anything, bake it in, in prayer. Um, and so so that it's, it's grounded in God. You're listening to people, you know, and, and especially in digital space. It's much better to, to, to listen uh, and ask questions than it is to make statements. And so listening gives permission um, for people to trust you. They trust you when you listen to them because they see that you're valuing them uh, over, over yourself. Uh, you're eating together. That's, that's interesting. We, we can nuance mm -hmm. that here in a little bit. You can serve. Uh, you, you're serving. You're positioning yourself in, in a in a place of, of serving. Um, there's some humility with that. You're sharing your story. You're sharing Jesus's story. And it's interesting that really the story component is at the, the end of this thing. Like it's not, it's not at the beginning. Oh, let me tell you what's going on in my life. It's, it's much more uh, about uh, positioning um, after, after the fact. Well, hey, look, I, guys, I want to I open this up, guys and gals. Uh, I, I want to open this up for, for conversation. Um, what... What, what do we like about this? Maybe what are some challenges that we're seeing in digital space? I sincerely, I want to use this as an opportunity. You are the focus group here. And we have Dave freaking Ferguson uh, on the call. So you tell me what, what works digitally, what doesn't work digitally. Let's nuance it here. Who's going first? And I would love to hear it candidly. I think Mark has got a really good question. I always got questions, Jeff. Uh, my question is this. So it's great. It's, it's deep personal relational ministry. I mean, it's the type of ministry that I deeply love and what we built youth group and stuff on. And I, I love it. And I love the strategy. It's like easy to understand. And, um, but how do you see this transferring to streaming culture um, in a world like for my world, right? There are hundreds of thousands, millions and millions of people who come for intentional one-way communication 
where they're literally looking for a talking head. I mean, they come to spectate the guy on the street corner who is shouting at them to come to Jesus. And so how does this translate to a world where the biggest influencers are the people who are not building relationships uh, with their viewer base and their fan base, the, the people who are consuming their content? Could you flip the coin and say that the influencer is trying to motivate people to do the blessed practices? So the, the, the influencer is not activating the blessed practices necessarily, but that's what they're encouraging people to do. Does that, do you think that would work? I, I'm curious, streaming culture being what it is, would, would that work? Mark doesn't think so. Uh, or you asked, I, I didn't I didn't know if I was being asked that question or Dave, if Dave was being asked that <laughs> question. I wasn't real sure if I was supposed to unmute. Uh, so I, I still. You tell me, uncertain. Martin. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, yeah, sure. I you mean, a lot of what we're doing is we're using streaming in digital space to bridge a gap and build relationship. But a lot of what we're doing is saying, Hey, we're, we're meeting you online, but we're constantly trying to navigate you towards more relational spaces. Um, but that isn't necessarily the culture and the bent of, of our stuff. So let, yeah, let I, me, I was just curious to hear what Dave thought about like how, yeah, let me, how let this, me take a, let me, let me take a stab at this Mark. And maybe I'm, maybe this is an air ball, but what the heck? Um, the, the, the biggest, I mean, is the, is, is, should the aspiration, I mean, there's going to be people who are, who are influencers, right. In the digital space, significant influencers. Um, millions and millions of people engaging with them. Um, in the physical space, that's kind of the equivalent of an Andy Stanley or a Craig Rochelle. Right? And I guess, and I, here's maybe my question. Do we want to create models where we're, our aspirations are just to be Craig Rochelle or Andy Stanley? Or do we want to create models that we're trying to mobilize everyday people to be able to engage digitally. You know what I'm saying? So I would say this is probably not a great strategy for Craig Rochelle because he's like one of the best communicators on the planet. And he ought to keep doing his thing, what he's doing. It's probably not a great strategy for Andy Stanley, but my hunch is it's probably a great strategy for the 10,000 or 75,000 people in his church. So I think to your question, I would probably compare those folks to high profile, brilliant communicators who just have, a, there's a different gifting. But if we're trying to mobilize lots of people for mission, I'm gonna suggest maybe this works. Now, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, this is what we're trying to figure out. So no, I, but I, I love that. And you know, the streaming culture is an interesting one. You know, I streamed for three hours today to 20 some people and half of them spoke to me, which means there was 105 people through my stream. The vast majority of them never said a word to me. Um, and, but I had the chance to influence them in, in some capacity because the time that I spent with them and the question then becomes for us, like how do we move those people into more intentional relational spaces where we can, we can do exactly what you're talking about, which is yeah. what I want to do. So, um, but, I, but yeah. I, I love it. Like how do we train people to do exactly that massively you know would would this not be a better tool not necessarily for twitch but for discord mm. i mean like tra train train your uh your hosts in discord and facebook groups to operate in, in a blessed mindset you know that that first engagement um to, to position begin with prayer listen to that and, and you're training your first responders i don't know what your term that you use mark but that first level engager um that that's reaching out to the new people you're running them through the blessed practices I, it would be interesting you're right twitch because jeff, so many people don't talk because, might be a challenge are you jeff you said because most of the folks on there are playing games and they're interacting in a different way so it's kind of like they're already just hanging out and so this is a way to actually equip them for how to engage in conversations that can lead to spiritual things yeah well, the way that Mark and streamers would use Discord is that's where really the discipleship, that's really where the relationships are happening. Mark's right. Like the majority of people are, are consuming a product on, on Twitch. 
and but the goal of Twitch is to drive to Discord, at least for the average streamer. Uh, and, and so, or the average church that's doing streaming. And so, I mean, really, I would see that being more of a focus on the Discord piece. And I, I don't want to get stuck on the, there's so many other applications to get into beyond just the, the, the streaming component. But I do think it's interesting to wrestle with um, how it could fit into a Discord, how it could fit into some of these asynchronous communities. But even more than that, I really, I think Bless gets to this place of multiplying it outside of our asynchronous communities where now we're leveraging the people that are connecting with us and we're helping them do it in their physical space in their digital space and that's where we're starting to see a lot more intentional multiplication the idea of the um i forget the, the story i typed it in chat but it was like it's it's not the consumer or it's not the converter it's it's the blesser um because you're allowing that trust to get built by beginning with prayer by listening by eating type of thing so love it um somebody else what, what, what do you what do y'all think i really think like uh, i'm thinking about the angle scale i talked to one of our people on uh dcn today understanding that twitch is basically like uh the 21st century of version of the radio so they're more than just a communication tool of like a of a sermon. It's actually more like Dave Ramsey on the radio every day, because you got it's very interactive, very fast paced, long periods of time. Pulling them to Discord can be the place where like Discord can be the front door for actually getting to know people, and then pulling them into relationships. So you're gonna have to think through a funnel on that and think through different spaces in the angle scale to say okay our community here in discord for this part is going to be here so i think channels would be a part i'm just as i'm listening to the conversation those are the things i'm thinking about and i just want to be i'm not trying to derail what, we, what we're talking about at all but the reason i'm asking is because we're, we're gathering together like the top 15 or 20 biggest influencers in twitch that are christians and are living as digital missionaries in cincinnati in a couple of months and we're literally going to be walking in with them in one of the sessions is about multiplication and how to actually disciple and deal with crisis inside of the community of people that God's enabling you to minister to because a lot of these people are really great entertainers but they don't have any pastoral experience so I'm like yeah I want to take this but how do I, I I really want to use this but I want to know the best ways to take this and train them on on this system so they can really begin building, building relationships, living as missionaries and discipling the, the already big raging fan base that they have that are watching them play video games and preach every day. So that that's why I'm asking, because I think it's incredibly useful. I just see the top down and the bottom up approach. So you're going to have, like you said, the Andy Stanley's, the Craig Groeschel's, they're going to do their thing. But those guys need to be all in on the grassroots doing the individual day-to-day -day things rather than trying to be them. So the top-down, bottom-up approach, as you're thinking through that place, those people of influence have the ability to really push the ball forward in the movement of practicing this. And to be honest, you, you should do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, as I quote Kerry Newoff. So even as we get more influence we should take some time to do that with our people as well as much as we possibly can i, I i'll throw i mean jeff hinted at this a little bit too and maybe the challenge for those people in influence are really are to create blessed cultures and i and i and i think and i and i think chesley chesley's exactly right that if you want to create a culture, I think, I mean, to me, there's three components. We can go into this way. One, there's value, narrative, and behavior. And, and you're going to reproduce who you are. So I encourage people, even people who are leading large networks and large movements, that you have to embody the, the smallest level of reproduction yourself if you want to, if you want to see that throughout your whole movement. So for example, like I get to lead the, our new thing network, our new thing movement. We help plant, you know, about 5,000 churches. 
So I know that I need to have, be in a small group, and I'm in a small group on Tuesday night, and I need to have an apprentice leader in that group and be doing the stuff myself. Now, I'll do that, and then I'll also work with network leaders, helping them reproduce. I won't do all the stuff in between, but I'll, start, I'll do it at the largest level, and I'll do it at the smallest level, which I think is exactly what, what Chesley's saying. <clears throat> and, and so, like for me, like one of the reasons I showed you, like, you know, here's on my journal and here's the people that I pray for, because I think you know, for me to actually do this, and I feel like, I mean, for me to actually kind of create that kind of culture, I actually have to embody it myself. I don't know if that contributes to what you were talking about, Chesley, or if that, what you're talking about top down or top and bottom. Yeah, it's that you said it clearer than I did when you said that uh, movement leaders are supposed to create blessed cultures. So I, I think that hit the nail on the head. But then I think what you added that, yeah, you want to do for one, what you do, what was it? What was the Kerry Newhoff quote? Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Good. How do we eat digitally? That's a good one. <laughs> Dave's doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Extra toasty. Yeah, and our very, church very we nice. do. We tell people to bring whatever, uh, depending on when their church starts, their church group starts. So it is a given. We and we talk about it. Like we'll even just, you know, we have different culture represented, so people bring different things, and it could be just as basic as, oh, I put lemon in my water, all the way to lemon, lemon, you know, pasta or something like that. So it varies. Um, and there's granted there gets to be competitiveness, you know, <laughs> in there sometimes, but that is how we do we, yeah, that's how we eat together. Now, when it comes to in the missional space, there's a little more, um, not structure, but I mean, there's a lot of, what do you call it? Um, invitation to whatever you want. Even if you don't bring anything to eat, you come anyway. Like if you're not prepared anything, it's just. Uh, but that's yeah and it's bad and we're and it's loud crunching eating drink it's we keep it all we don't mute ourselves um during that time together yeah I know and I have like weird ear hearing issues so there's some things the crunching is um can be very distracting sometimes for me when I'm facilitating <laughs> so but that's that's weird for me. Yeah. Like when people are smacking. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, Dave, I'd why, why eating? Why? why? Why was eating? I mean, other than the E fit into the blessed model. What is it about eating that, that made sense uh, for you to add it? Uh, I mean, I think that I mean, like, think about Jesus with Zacchaeus. I mean, that that was a life changing meal. So I mean, he he was our he was he was our model. I mean, or Matthew's party. I mean, that that's where life. And and I think all of us. I mean, I remember I remember that the first date at Aurelio's Pizza with my wife. I mean, that's that's when our relationship changed. And you know, we we went out with friends last night. We had great Mediterranean food at a place called Vasili's. And there's you know, I mean, all there's just something that qualitatively changes when you share food with other people. One of the things that we, one of the things that we have done a community, it's, it's not quite as dramatic as some of the stuff you're talking about, but one of the things that we've seen as an outreach that's been super helpful is Alpha. About 40% of the people that go through Alpha at community come out on the other side and, and they, will, they will say that they named Jesus as their Lord for the very first time, which is amazing. But one of the key things that Alpha has been brilliant about over the years is they always have a meal because it it's not the Nikki Gumbel videos that are so riveting, but it's actually the community they create and actually the safe place to ask any questions you want. And so then they go into the pandemic and we continue to do it. We took the whole thing online. We continue to see the same kind of thing conversion. 
but a lot of the, a lot of them would they would exactly exactly like Stacy was saying, people would okay so it was kind of like you know bring your own, and they would sh they would share a meal and it was just like this over Zoom. I, th I think in our culture eating is um, uh, something we just do, but in I think in the culture that uh, uh, Christ lived in, uh, as well as what goes on in the Middle East right now, it's it's an event. And we don't make it an event. In an event, you get to know people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think about some of the interviews I've had over the years, some of the applications I've filled out, um, so forth. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, people ask uh, a reference is, have you eaten together? And that, says, that tells a lot about the person. Have you eaten together? Have you shared a meal? Uh, we do it digitally, we do it in face-to-face, -face. Uh, but uh, it makes a difference in how we, uh, how we are of each other. So Chesley shared an idea about Uber Eats, um, you know, and even in my own life, I've had people, um, not Uber Eats, but, you know, deliver stuff to me. We have one, several other op, DoorDash. Uh, you know, I've gotten DoorDash delivered a couple of times uh, by people that weren't even in the same city as me uh, when I had COVID. I had a friend of mine who I never met uh, sent me candy and, and drinks, uh, you know, to my house via DoorDash, which I thought was an, an awesome, uh, and also it's an awesome way to, way to serve. What are some other maybe, and, and you know, uh, Stacy was actually talking about Chomping down, literally, we're watching Dave eat some uh, some Cheez Its. Are, are, is there any other creativity centered around uh, the idea of, of eating together? I mean, are, are we are we breaking out our our, our virtual reality stuff, or are we? And we can probably go down the metaverse side. I'm sure augmented reality, lots of stuff soon. But anybody else got any creative ideas centered around the eating? That's interesting, Christopher. Is there something online that can replace eating to generate uh, the same effect? It would it would be interesting. I mean, there was. I mean, it, I don't know if it replaces eating, but uh, there was there was a there's a company in in uh, Pittsburgh called Blue Monkey Tea, and they do all these really really funky kind of tea tea tasting stuff. And they will, and so there was this other couple. We we're kind of starting to become friends. It was actually again during the pandemic. So they would email, they would they mail you the, the the tasting, and you would pair them with chocolates. And we actually did it with some friends. I mean, the people, the company who hosted the whole thing was online. They were based out of Pittsburgh, but the other couple was on the other side of Chicago. And you know, tea tasting and chocolate was, and. Yeah, I felt like at the end of it, I got to know them better, and we actually, yeah, became better friends as a result of that. I could see uh, Mark is, is commenting in here too. Uh, gaming, you know, is, is another one of those heavily relational type of things, and you could definitely see that, Mark. Um, so very, very true there. Well, as we're looking at the other, begin with prayer, um, listening, eating, uh, serving. Uh, story uh, sharing Jesus like are, are there any other obstacles you know I, I know eating was the big one that stood out for me do, do you guys see any other obstacles or challenges or things that uh, and operating it digitally I'll piggyback off of you know I, I think us talking about eating it doesn't seem like an obstacle at this point because I'm just thinking of the things that you could do from a community standpoint of getting to know people, pairing like some of the gaming while doing like some, if you can put some planning together where you are sharing the same type of meal from like the same restaurant. Like if you do some coordination logistically where people are eating the same thing at the same time while playing a, a game together digitally, I think that could be a huge win from a, from a group perspective. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, we did that in COVID. We did happy hour, let's be honest. <laughs> we, were, we were testing alcohol at the same time. <laughs> so it was, it was good stuff. So uh, 
yeah, but we had uh, we had a lot of fun. So I could see some really uh, cool things come out of that. You know, with our friends, we had like four couples that we didn't even know that were on there with us that we got to know because of that. Still haven't met them in person, you know, so that which is pretty cool. So doing things like that, I think, would be um, beneficial. We uh, with the sharing piece, though, uh, or the serving piece. We had somebody that had surgery and all the guys on the community, Dan Tebow, I don't think he's on a phone call, but his community got together, put money together and um, bought like a full, like full week's worth of meals and like uh, other things all digitally. Like these guys are all across the country. So it's pretty cool. Like, I think you get, you have the ability to do that in, uh, in this community as well. So I don't really see any obstacles. I think you're just going to have to think more creatively. Yeah. Talk, yeah. We yeah. did that and just way, recently. Digital, That's what we did. Sorry. Digital church network does not condemn nor condone the idea of alcohol being used in context of church services. So I just want to stamp that right there. Chesley Lundy. Keep that out of the conversation, please. Moving forward, that'll be nice. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, Stacy. Go ahead. No, you're welcome. You're <laughs> that welcome. was totally worth it. Um, yeah, so we did that. We we pretty much in my in our community groups, we pretty much know each other's Venmo, PayPal, Cash App stuff. So when there is something that happens, it we just send money. Like if we like like our own benevolence fund, <laughs> but some people don't have that. Right. And so what what uh, some what some people or some people prefer sending me money and I just send it directly to the person. But that, you know, that's to establish trust and safety and things like that. And then the the lead pastor, you know, I will keep them updated on what we're doing. And then sometimes the church will step step in because the church has a benevolence fund, but it starts with the group and then um, send things. And sometimes it is Uber Eats and mules and things like that. So, um, so it's been more for uh, deaths in the families. That's kind of what we've been doing lately. Doctor, yeah, Dr. Harris shared something earlier in chat uh, about shared experiences. Um, you know, maybe the idea, gaming is a shared experience, eating is a shared experience. Um, what are some other shared experiences maybe beyond in, in digital metaverse space that could maybe consider, considered something like eating in, in digital metaverse. Any other shared experiences pop up to anybody? So let me specify for a second if I can. Um, I'm, I'm on mute for the most part because I'm, I'm, I, I got three kids here, uh, seven and under. And so it's, it's an unpredictable environment at the moment. But, <laughs> so, um, my wife is leading her small group tonight in the other room. <laughs> so, but I think um, in my Facebook group, we do uh, communion uh, once a month. And, um, and so obviously we're, we're doing it together. Uh, I'll play a, a YouTube video, worship video about the blood of Jesus or communion. And, um, and so that helps in like, so that's part of a quote unquote shared experience, which adds to the, um, what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here. Because if we have food, uh, we're all eating at the same time, right? Having coffee at the same time, whatever. It's, it's at the same time um, and maybe even for the same purpose, but it's not, but it doesn't have the same shared experience as if, as if you just put your nachos in my cheese dip. Like that's a shared, Kind of like there's a so there's a different level of transparency, openness that 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 you know food uh, sharing a meal opens up relationships. It it um, it opens up uh, vulnerability, transparency, things like that. So I think these elements that make sharing a meal powerful and and transformational. It take a, one relationship from one level to the next. Like like they were saying there with his with his wife. Um, I mean, and, and I don't think anybody who's married on here. Uh, didn't at some point have dinner, <laughs> right? So there's something huge about sharing the meal. And I think online you can, you can um, partake of meals at the same time, but it, it, I don't think it has the same powerful effect 
as like what Mark was saying, when people are gaming together, right? So obviously gaming is different from eating. But I, so when he said that, it just made me think about sharing an experience together. So in addition to eating food, like what is it? And I, I think there has some kind of affinity, right? Like Mark was saying, like they're all gaming, right? There's, so I think affinity is a part of that, uh, some kind of a, um, so as we think about, you know, brainstorming, what are kind of shared experiences you can actually have online? Um, I think there's some things like that that we gotta look at. Yeah, what can we be doing at the same time? Like that, that opens us up, whether it's, um, when I, it, one reason why I, th I say that is because you, if you're on uh, watching TV online, you, you can now do these watch parties. All right, think about that. Well, they, they, you can pick a movie and they'll let you do a watch party online. Same way with, with Facebook, with uh, worship services and stuff. Like the watch party thing was a thing because people are trying to open up these shared experiences that you can, you're experiencing something for the first time, right, together. And then you can, you can talk about it. So I think adding to the food element online, there's gotta be another thing that can actually help that go a little, go a little deeper and have that same principle there. <laughs> I'm gonna go, go back on mute now. <laughs> I am so impressed you held it together that entire time with daddy, 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 like that. That was, that was very cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dave, I'm, I'm kind of vibing that eating experience a, a little bit. I think eating is a huge component. It is something to work on, but the, the intentionality of the experience, I, I think, did you want to, Dave, do you want maybe want to vibe a little bit what you're thinking about that? You asking me? Yeah, sure. No, I was just picking up on what they were. I think it was what Chesley said too. I mean, yeah, because I mean, I mean, we just heard a number of different things, whether you know, whether it was gaming or others, that it was kind of like an, a shared experience, and and those that is something you're on. Okay, it's not the exact same as eating. It could be eating, but what is the experience we could have together that takes a lot? Because I do think the 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 one of the things I've observed, I think the blessed practices. I think the right word is kind of epigenetic. They kind of build each other. You begin with prayer, you listen, you have an experience together. In that experience together, you really get to know each other. Then you're able to serve because you understand what needs they have. And then you get a chance to share your story. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm buying it. Wow. That's why John's the doctor. Nicely <laughs> done. He's smart. He's got that. He's got that. That doctorate in transformational discipleship, so that he can well, he can just I, whip that up. <laughs> Y'all are crazy. No, I actually got that. I was I've been thinking about it and didn't have an answer until Mark said what he said about them gaming together, and I was like, "That's it. That's that's it. They're 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 sharing that, and they are, um, and it just opens up. It opens up conversations. It opens up. So in different context, because I think uh, David mentioned how the culture is different back then as far as what eating represents. So even today, with a lot of Americans with different cultures, eating can have the same effect. I mean, just like, I mean, it just does, right? Um, yeah. but, but there are there are also some other things that can also have the same effect. And that's what I just want to throw out there because he would just give a really good example of that. Yeah. Then the, the contextualization of what experience is, demographic, age, platform, nationality continent like it's 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 up for grab you create the experience that makes sense for the per you you began with prayer and you listen to them and through the listening process hopefully it's being revealed what that experience needs to be like i didn't even know eat was a problem i was actually the guy two weeks ago that was like ah we can make eat work it's fine don't worry about <laughs> it but no i think experience really plays well here yeah i do too Any other questions? We got just a couple more minutes, uh, and, and we're gonna we're gonna land the plane. Go ahead, Stacy. One thing that I that is just kind of thinking in my head is that we had someone in our crew that um, had eating disorder, and so we were sensitive though to that, and we had to be creative of what that was going to be like. And but we would only know that because we had built trust, and that person shared that with us. But we um, 
but that was just kind of one, one thing. And even same goes with, you know, alcohol or whatever, fill in the blank, whatever it is. But that was something that just kind of popped up in my head and within our small groups, it's like that. It's uh, being aware um, when we make those kind of decisions. And, and it's as a group, obviously, but yeah, there's some sensitivities to be aware. Of. Very, very true, well said. Hey, Jess, can I add one, can I have one thing and then you can land the plane, is that okay? Yeah, sure. You just said that you asked like, what problems do we see? And in our, from our context, one of the biggest obstacles that we've run into is many people in the digital space are there because they don't want to enter relational spaces. <laughs> Either they're dealing with problems. I have tons of people on the autism spectrum, um, people with significant disabilities. They're terrified to enter relational spaces. That's the reason they're engaging with us is because they, they don't want to engage with people, whether that's anxiety or whatever. The biggest obstacle we've had is not like, let's work this. This system is incredible. You know, it's, it's easy to communicate and it's really helpful. Our biggest obstacle is getting people to get, enter it. Like, how do I get people to get to the point where I can listen to them? Cause I have a ton of people who are listening, but won't come into a, a digital space where I can hear them. And so that has been one of the things that we've been working really hard to overcome in our context is like, how do we create really intentional digital spaces where all that we're there to do is hear your story? That's it. No, no, no strings attached. Like, cause just come and tell us your story. That's all we want. And um, some of that stuff has been working. Some of it hasn't, but that's been really hard for us. We just have a lot of people who that's the reason they're there, you know, is they don't want to be in some of those relational spaces. And, and Mark, like what things have worked? Uh, personal invites. It's mostly been personal invites. Like it has to be me going to somebody and personally in a direct message saying, Hey, after church this Wednesday night, I'd really love to get to know you. Would you stop by and hang out with me in the meet pastor Mark channel? And mm -hmm. if I invite people personally, they have a high chance of coming, but if we just announce it, almost no one will ever show up. But if they feel valued because we made the personal connection and made the personal invite, then sometimes they, they will pop by for some people. It just takes a long time to build, to become comfortable and feel safe to share a story too. I mean, that's a little bit of a listen, isn't it? Hey, come over here so I can listen to you. You're inviting them, you know, coming quite literally into the conversation. Um, and so it's interesting how that would even pair out what you're describing. Um, it's good. Uh, who is it? Uh, Nicole, you had a, had a question? No, actually, I was just going to speak into what Mark was saying, because since I'm in this kind of unique frame, I'm doing this with kids and youth. Um, mm -hmm. We see a lot of that on autism spectrum, Down syndrome, um, just point blank, the ability not to talk. So we've come up with these creative ways and just think about it, you know, not promoing anybody else, but there are actually stations that all the button does is let you talk. So then you just listen back to everything that they're saying and you can respond. Maybe the space that they're already in is that sacred space. That's the space where they come to you. So sometimes we've made this box around our limitless possibility of church without walls. Like this is a place where I preach, but that's the place where they come to listen they're doing it in reverse. They've already been blessed. Now they're listening and we're trying to get them to the space to be blessed. They're already there. We just have to manipulate the space, what we call it, so that they can say, oh, this is my space. Well, I'm already here. I'm comfortable here. I come here all the time. It's easy for me to communicate here. If I go to this button and I press this button, I can just talk or record something and it'll just go to you. And then maybe you'll send something back. But I'm comfortable there. If we start out where they're comfortable meeting them where they're at already, because they're already coming to you, that's the space. You already have their attention. That's great. All right. Hey, it's, uh, it's, it's nine o'clock at least central, top of the hour, wherever you are. Um, and, and so we're, we're going to land the plane. This has been... Uh, this has been an incredible night. Dave, uh, thank you for taking time after hours. Uh, a lot of our people are 
uh, bivocational and having the nine to five jobs. And so that's why we do these roundtables late at night. And so, so that we're all able to see this. Uh, and so thank you for taking the time to, to do this. Can I, can uh, I say something real quick, Jeff, before you wrap up too? I want, please. I, I want to say thank you to you all. I mean, um, it was nice of Jeff to invite me on. I know a little about the blessed practice. I don't know a ton about what you guys are doing. I'm, I am, a, I am trying to learn and trying to, stay stay really on the edge of what you're doing i am convinced though i'm convinced that what you're doing really is um i think an important part of the future of the church and um whatever encouragement i can be in ways that i can help i would i would love to be an ally for you so i wanted to I'm, I'm super excited about what jeff is doing and putting you know digital churches into networks so we can start more of these um, and I would love to help champion it however I can. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm a fan of each of yours and thank you for what you're doing. Oh, and we've got plans for Dave Ferguson, trust All me. All right, bring them on. We're, we're, we're going to be good. Awesome. But hey, listen, this, this has been great. Thank you, uh, y'all, for, for joining this evening. We'll, we'll put it on, on YouTube and, and get it out there posted in DCN. So if you want to, some of you came in late, want to catch up or, or share with others, you know, go through normal channels on that to do it. But thank you very much for being part of, uh, of this roundtable. Dave, once again, thank you uh, for being here. But we're going to land a plane. So for Dave, for Jeff, for everybody else, thanks for jumping into this conversation. And I'm sure we'll have more coming up soon here as we keep diving into digital missionaries, blessed practices, how all this comes together. So thanks, y'all. And buy, buy Dave's book. I, I, I see the book. Um, I, I feel like, hey, Nicole, can you post that link in... Um, in in fam so if people want to sure I'll grab it buy yeah grab it from amazon and, and post it post it in fam not in chat because i'm hanging up but thanks everybody appreciate it and uh, i'm sue i'm sure we'll see you around fam y'all have a good night awesome thanks jeff yep <laughs>